am an applied mathematician, and uh, I have a small secret to tell you. Um, applied mathematicians are quite suspicious lots, really. Not suspicious people, but we're very suspicious of our subject as a whole. Um, this is because, largely, we think that it's unreasonably effective at representing the real world. So now, when you study applied mathematics, you learn about abstract patterns. You learn about that electricity in circuits, for example, behaves exactly the same as water in pipes. So you can use the same kind of equations to model it. And um, this is also true for much more complex phenomena, such as a flock of birds. Um, the same equations that could be used to describe turbulent fluids can also work for describing the motion of birds, and that's an amazing thing. And this math bug, if you like, you get this sort of um, panoptic view across the different disciplines, and you realize that they're all interrelated in a very fundamental way. It kind of stays with you. So in my PhD, as I said, I, I studied abstract algorithms for making predictions from digital data. It's all very well to have some abstract algorithms, but um, for a thesis, what you need is in, in applied maths is uh, an actual application. So I stumbled upon this really interesting area, which is to do with the biomedical analysis of digital voice signals. So a lot of these algorithms were invented by clinicians in the 1940s, back before the computer era. All they had were tape machines, and they were just looking at waveforms on, um, on tape recordings. Um, and so what I wanted to do is to combine contemporary machine learning algorithms to make diagnostic predictions with these algorithms. And there was a real surprise twist at the end of that story, which is that my own algorithms, which were purely mathematical, the ones that I developed in my thesis, were actually more make, were making more accurate diagnostic predictions than using the clinician's algorithms. And that made my thesis, I'm happy to say. Now, um, after graduating, um, I collaborated with a hydrologist and an economist. That's an unusual collaboration. Uh, so what we wanted to do is to forecast the weather with algorithms based on historical rainfall data. Now, um, as was mentioned earlier, the um, weather forecasting industry is a massive industry. For example, they have $10 million supercomputers with which they can throw at the problem of forecasting uh, the weather by solving the equations of atmospheric dynamics to make predictions. So it would seem that competing against this Goliath with only a laptop and a set of, of, of data would seem to be, well, um, I think foolhardy might be the description. <laughs> um, so after a lot of effort, what we were able to do is to produce algorithms that by crunching the data could make predictions that were as accurate as weather supercomputer forecasts on the scale of a few uh, kilometers. Also, there were some dumb algorithms for example, if you just take the average rainfall over a day, over uh, the historical average rainfall, and use that as a prediction, actually sometimes you find that that is more accurate than supercomputer forecasts. So this, of course, is extremely surprising and, uh, as you can imagine, quite difficult to publish in, a, in a, uh, a meteorology journal. But we got there eventually. So in these projects, I tried to be as rigorous as possible. What I was doing was collating as many algorithms from across the literature as I could, being quite voracious about where I sampled these algorithms from and actually not caring that much about what disciplines they came from. And also putting in a lot of overly simple algorithms. And now, in order to be able to come up with useful knowledge, you need to be able to pair that set of algorithms down to something useful uh, that can make useful predictions. So to minimize selection bias, I use machine learning algorithms to ruthlessly throw away all of those algorithms that are not performing well. But still, this process actually leads to accurate predictions, impressively accurate predictions in many cases. And being an applied mathematician, that success extreme, it worried me a lot because it looked to me to be unreasonably effective. So I had long conversations with colleagues about this. Um, agonizing over the possibility that I'd overlook some hideous methodological error that would make me look very stupid indeed. And so we collaborators, what we tried to do was we really wanted to break this idea. We wanted to make it fail. So we assembled 30,000 data sets from across diverse different scientific disciplines, from hyd hydrology, from geophysics to astrophysics, acoustics, um, biomedicine, molecular biology, it's a long list, and others. And we then implemented 9,000 different algorithms. And this took a really deep dive into the literature. 
And now what we wanted to do was to test this method out systematically. So we exhaustively applied each algorithm to each data set. And then what we used was further machine learning algorithms to remove all of those algorithms except those with the highest predictive performance right across all these different data sets. So that, as you can imagine, took a lot of work. So after two and a half years of exhausting work and some very, very tired graduate students, we, this revealing big picture emerged. What we found is that many prediction problems from right across the literature could actually be accurately solved. So it would seem that my earlier successes were really not isolated examples. This happens in many circumstances. And in many cases, the winning algorithms appeared in diverse and very unexpected combinations. And many times, these winning algorithms, the ones that actually generated useful knowledge, were not suggested necessarily by fundamental theories in that specific discipline, and not necessarily on the basis of expert knowledge either. So I'll give you an example. There's a long-standing problem in biomedical engineering, and this is to automatically identify seizures from um, EEG recordings. Now, there's a 20-plus um, year history of approaches to do this in literature. But in our search, we found greater than 150 algorithms. Each alone could detect seizures with really high accuracy. And there are some problems that it just seems they're trivial. They're easily solved with dumb algorithms. For example, it suffices to ca calculate the average heart rate um, in order to detect congestive heart failure from uh, heart rate variability signals. Now, again, this is a persistent problem in the biomedical um, engineering literature. And it's prompted a huge literature of very, very elaborate algorithms, which it turns out are just unnecessarily complex. Now, I want to take a step back here and just try to synthesize those experiences into something that has more general appeal, perhaps. I think we can divide science. Many people look at this from, from this point of view, that you can decide, divide science into three separate branches. There's experiment, there's theory, and there's computer simulation more recently. But what I'm describing here doesn't really fit, doesn't really fit within that, um, those three branches. It's not simulations, because we're actually combining large data sets with algorithms. And it's not just statistics, either. Because really, many of those algorithms have no obvious statistical interpretation at all. And what we're doing is we're taking very extended measures to guard against so-called data dredging. That's where you find spurious results just by chance. And what we're doing also is we're mixing and matching algorithms from right across the disciplines. And we're applying advances, the latest advances in machine learning, in order to exploit heavy computational resources. And also, none of this would be possible without the very large data sets that are available today. So I'm simply asking this question, well, is it possible that this is actually a new approach to scientific inquiry? Because it doesn't seem to fit within those existing categories. Now, I really don't know the answer to that. I'm asking this question, but I know that there are some disciplines where they already assume that this is actually true. They're doing it already. For example, prediction competitions in computer science and forecasting competitions in um, statistics. So these approaches can actually produce valuable new scientific insights that are useful. So I think I want to just ask what we can learn from this approach. Well, first of all, we need huge amounts of experimental data. There's really very, there's a huge amount of, um, of politics, there's bureaucracy, there's a lack of vision, I think, in sharing experimental data with people. And we need to be able to share data amongst researchers, but also with the public as well, because sharing data enhances reproducibility of these kind of results. And we should not prejudge either, because we need this commitment, I think, in the scientific disciplines to radical impartiality. We need to avoid favored theories that persist for some decades in, the, in many disciplines. And you can have favored models that are often um, used over and over again as sort of paradigm examples, but they're not necessarily the best examples. And the data itself often gets siloed into particular disciplines and doesn't escape where it could be tested against other data sources. And finally, I think this approach is inherently collaborative because I really want to question this sort of first to publish attribution of scientific findings. I don't know if it's actually as productive as we believe. I think collaborative approaches are more likely to lead to new insights. So I'll just end by saying this. The scientific theories that can withstand this harsh algorithmic challenge will have passed an extremely rigorous test, because not only will they have explanatory power, 
they will also have practical predictive power as well. So what we'll have from these results is, there is confidence that these theories can actually compete from right across the disciplines. Because after all, I think scientific discovery is an open process. And I think this approach teaches us that no one knows how and where the next big breakthrough will come from. Thank you very much.